So we're absolutely delighted to have you here. Um, I'm excited also to be able to showcase a collaboration between um, the International Human Rights Law Program, the IHRP, and the ASPER Center uh, for Constitutional Law. There are, needless to say, lots of overlapping issues between the two centers' programs, and this is something that we want to think about more to kind of create these synergies and um, um, take advantage of the fact that we have these tremendous um, assets at the faculty. Um, it's also really nice to have this chance to welcome back some people, graduates, including, I believe, of the IHRP and then um, of our doctoral program. Um, and of course, Gisela, um, our visiting scholar, delighted to, uh, that she's um, able to be part of this as well. Um, so I was thrilled, and this was um, in August, I believe, when I first heard about this idea that Rebecca, in her then capacity, Rebecca Cook um, of Interim, director of the IHRP hatched about this program and she delicately asked whether I would um, introduce it and he said of course this is a fantastic thing to do thank you so much so here I am but this is an even better world now and the best of all worlds I'm also able to introduce to you the new director of the IHRP um, Sandra Wisner who started all but well not well actually today we could say it's two weeks that you have under under your belt. Um, she um, is a seasoned, um, versatile uh, human rights lawyer, having worked for the UN in Cambodia, having been in South Africa, having taken on a whole range of issues. And most recently, she uh, worked with the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti, which is an organization that is focused on grassroots human rights work with human rights lawyers on the ground um, in, in Haiti. Sandra, we're really thrilled that you are at the helm of the IHRP, and it's great to have you here. And would you please um, take the microphone and provide a land acknowledgement? Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Lita. Um, and yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Um, and, and I'm honored to begin with a, a land acknowledgement. Uh, so this is to acknowledge that the University of Toronto is located on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. Uh, Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 uh, with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And this statement is, of course, one small step in acknowledging the violent history that brought us to this land and a reminder that we should seek to understand our place within history. So I will now hand it over to Professor Cope to Tal <laughs> to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Professor Tal, right. No. <laughs> I'm not going to introduce the speakers. I'm going to let um, Professor Cook do that. I just wanted to say welcome to everybody and thank you on behalf of the Asper Center for Constitutional Rights. We're very pleased to be co-hosting this book forum today and are really looking forward to this conversation. Um, just a few words in terms of the tech talk. We're joined by virtual attendees in the um, webinar because we're recording this. And so to our virtual attendees, hello, and you're most welcome. And speaking to you, you can ask questions through the chat function or also through the Q&A function. And I, with my colleagues that are running the webinar on the back end, um, I'll be raising questions to our panelists through um, from the virtual attendees when we come to our Q&A or our question period. Just another note, this book forum will be recorded and available shortly on the faculty's YouTube channel in the coming days. And I also will be sharing some links for the webinar um, attendees in the chat. So I will now turn over to Professor Cook to introduce our guests. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tao, and welcome those of you online and in person. It's a distinct pleasure to host this book forum on Nanette Kelly book, People Forced to Flee, Change, and Challenge with the Asper Center for Constitutional Rights, and in particular with Tao Schreier, the manager of the Asper Center 
and herself a co-author of Refugee Law in South Africa, the second edition of which is forthcoming next year. Its director, Cheryl Milne, who's joining us online from Halifax, and I thought that addressing forced displacement of people requires not only the application of international human rights law, but it also has to be accompanied by commensurate domestic asylum policies and necessary domestic legal scaffolding for durable solutions for displaced persons. The urgency of this problem is now. As this book explains, there's over 82 million displaced persons at the end of 2020, but only 35,000 of those people were settled in 2020. The ebook is available um, free of charge um, online through UNHCR and the link Tal is putting on the, on the web. Uh, we have copies here for sale for $20 if you want to prefer a hard version. Now, it's a distinct pleasure to introduce Nanette Kelly, who's worked for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees for, I think, over 20 years, where she served in several senior management positions in Geneva, Beirut, and New York. Her last assignment was the writing of this remarkable book. Prior to that, before joining UNHCR, she served here in Canada for eight years on the Immigration and Refugee Board and held various policy roles with international humanitarian agencies focusing on development, immigration, and refugee issues. She is co-author of Making the Mosaic, the History of Canadian Immigration Policy with Michael Trevilko, and they are currently writing a contemporary history of Canadian immigration policy. Most importantly, Nanette is somebody who has always had her eyes on the horizon, always had her eyes on the horizon. So it's a real pleasure to welcome her back to the law school to speak to her. Nanette. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for the very generous introduction and kind words, and also to the International Human Rights Law Program and the Asper Center for making this possible um, and all the energies that went into it, because I know this is a lot of work. And also thanks to the panelists for taking some time out of their busy schedules to join us and to all of you who are here and, and also virtually for, for joining us and discussing the issues that are raised in the book. And I'm just going to pause because I need a little help in, in changing the, the presentation on the screen. Drawer, I'd Thank you so much. And um, I, I, I thought before I got into the book itself, I just wanted to indicate that this book came to, the reason why this book was commissioned was to mark the 70th anniversary of the International Convention on, Re on the Status of Refugees. And it seemed to me very important that if we were going to do a book like that, that we had to be inspired and the focus really had to be on the lives of so many people who have been brutally uprooted and who have had to struggle against all odds to make a future for themselves and also for their families. And as well to keep center of focus, those of communities, most of whom are in low income or middle income countries who open their doors to refugees and give them safety. And with that in mind, the aim of the book is to reflect back on the 70 year history of the international protection regime and identify what's gone well, but most importantly, to also speak to the challenges that have persistently come in the way of providing robust protection and solutions to forcibly displaced persons and how we can elucidate, how we can do better, what, what do we need to do better for the future? So that, that's the, 
real ambition of the book. And I'm going to pause for a second to say that before writing it, we commissioned papers from a whole group of stakeholders on various issues, from refugees and IDPs, from NGOs, from academics, think tanks, multilateral development institutions. And they were a wealth of really good analysis and ideas. And they're also available on the UNHCR website. And I, I surely hope that I've done justice to them in the page book. The book itself is got five parts. And the first part logically starts with the history. Um, we've known, for example, we know that since uh, the history of mankind, uh, human kind, I should say, people have been forced to flee and often for causes that are very similar to today, resource scarcity, climate, and conflict. But one thing I had always assumed was that the provision of asylum was a modern development. And what I learned in writing this book, that that's not true at all. In fact, there is evidence dating back 3,000 years of ancient Egypt providing political asylum to, for example, the deposed king of the Hittite empire. Greek city-states were also known to provide refugee, refuge and special privileges to fellow, not for fellow um, citizens from other city-states, allied city-states. Uh, the history of displacement is quite rich in the, during the Roman Empire period. The Roman Empire, of course, was a source of considerable displacement, but it also received thousands of refugees. And as in Greece, they were not uniformly treated. Political and military considerations governed how they were treated. So some were given autonomy, but others were forcibly conscripted or enslaved. For those of you who are interested in the history of asylum, there is a lot of great literature on flight for religious persecution from the 15th to the 17th um, centuries. And what that reveals is that many refugees were able to get safety in states which shared their religion. But it's also the case that there were groups that could enter other states who were of, of a minority religion, Jewish refugees in Europe, for example, provided they often, they often had to show they had skills or capital for which the state was in need. So it was a very partial response, very ad hoc, which continued through the 18th century when the phenomena of political refugees first comes more to the fore due to the revolutions that were sweeping Europe and in the United States. Political refugees at that time were accepted into countries of shared political ideology, but often through generally general immigration channels. There wasn't a distinct category of political refugee. Although interestingly, extradition treaties of that time did have provisions that prevented the return of political exiles. But what I'm trying to convey here is that asylum has a very long history, but prior to the mid 20th century, it really was ad hoc and partially extended, basically on the um, basis of shared identity or, or whether or not the refugees could have been a benefit to the hosting state. What makes the 1951 convention so important is that it was a global framework. And the motivation for that was because during World War II, after World War II, there were many millions of forcibly displaced persons. And the only way that could be dealt with was by a coordinated response. So the convention aimed to provide the broadest um, range of protections and solutions for refugees. And so part one traces that history. Part two then goes into what happened next. How well has the convention been applied over the years. And it shows that it has expanded its reach, geographic and, and interpretive. It's been incorporated its precepts into regional treaties and national legislation. It's provided protection for many, many millions of refugees. But what this part also shows is that many states, states uniformly around the globe, try to limit their obligations on the convention. And the book spends a fair amount of time on high income states that are willing to provide humanitarian assistance and development assistance to refugees abroad, but do what they can to limit their obligations through policies that try to intercept refugees, create barriers to entry, uh, limit the reach of the convention definition. So what this creates is a gap between commitment and practice that 
continues to need to be addressed. The book also looks at internal displacement, which now are strips refugee displacement, internal displacement being within border, within people who are displaced within their own countries. It looks at the development of the international guiding principles on international displacement, the normative framework that also was incorporated into regional and national laws. And it looks at the practice, how well have those principles been upheld, which is very similar to the refugee story. It's, un it's uneven. And also in this part of the book, it looks at climate displacement hearing a lot about climate displacement. The book tries to cut through what is myth, what is reality, what are the projections, and importantly, look at the many international, it's kind of a dizzying array of international frameworks to address various aspects of climate displace, displacement from prevention, mitigation, adaptation, protection, and to the extent to which they've been effective and highlight some regional practices that are very promising in terms of how we may wish to see, see things going forward. Part three then looks at the issue of um, solutions. I, I think it's entitled An Uneven Record, if I recall, but honestly, I, I, you could have, I could have entitled it The Dismal Record because it's, mm -hmm. it's really atrocious. Um, in the 60 years, voluntary return, has been heralded for history, throughout history as the preferred solution. And yet the statistics show that over 60 years, voluntary return was only available to less than 10% of refugees and less than 20% of IEPs. Um, in the last 10 years for refugees, voluntary return has fallen to, I think, 4%. Resettlement has only been a solution for a very small proportion of refugees. And local integration has largely been elusive. Internally displaced people should persons should have a right to integrate locally, but they're often constrained from doing so. Sometimes it's because of the remoteness of the locations that they're in and lack of economic opportunity, but it's also very much due to government neglect and also discrimination. Refugees are by and large in most countries throughout um, low and middle income countries are legally prohibited from locally integrated. And so the book looks at all the major displacement situations over the last 70 years and what has been the record on solutions and really it's a bleak read. But there are new, it speaks to some that we need new approaches. We can't automatically assume that voluntary repatriation is a preferred solution in every case. And where it is, there are things that we could do to facilitate it. Because refugees, when it's safe to return home, tend to go home in a staggered manner. So they may go, one person may go home to check out the situation to see if they can make a living and later bring their family over. But refugees can be, there can be a disincentive to doing that if they leave the asylum country and then cannot go back. So there's room to have migratory um, agreements that allow more cross-border processing. We have also need to widen the immigration channels for um, refugees and internally displaced persons. UNHCR and the OECD did a, what I think is a very interesting study in 2019. And it showed that 60% of individuals coming to the OECD country from the largest displacement situations in the world came through family reunification uh, education and work permit processes, far more than came through resettlement. And notwithstanding that, they made a very small proportion of the overall countries admitted under, nationals committed, uh, admitted under those programs, which suggests that we could do more to open up those programs if some of the constraints that face forcibly displaced persons in applying for them will overcome. And finally, the book, this, this part of the book also, and perhaps somewhat controversially, says we need to rethink local integration. Over the years, um, the international community has been very reluctant to say to hosting countries, um, you should locally integrate these displaced populations for reasons that we can well appreciate. But we have a lot of economic literature that's now coming on stream that shows that the impact of forced displacement on host countries is not as negative as we once thought, and in fact can be positive. In most displacement situations, refugees, for example, are less than 1% of the hosting population. And yet we have situations in the world today, many, 
that are protracted over several generations. So this is to say it can be, depending on the context, there may be more room to advocate and support host countries for providing more permanent uh, stay to refugees on their territory. The part four of the book, there's five parts, so I'm coming to the end. Part four um, says, well, the solutions record is pretty grim. How are we doing in terms of um, how are refugees and IDPs faring in the places that they're displaced. And the story there is also rather disappointing. Their lives are very much circumcised, circumscribed by lack of opportunities, lack of education, poor health, lack of employment opportunities. And although they are among the most vulnerable populations of the world and should be included in global development um, initiatives and often um, are recognized as, as the should be included, the history of that has been very, um, very disappointing and they haven't been. And this has started to change. Um, one of the big catalysts for change was the Syria crisis when refugees were coming, over a million refugees were coming to Europe and Europe went, oh my, um, maybe what we need to do is provide better forms of stay for refugees in countries in the region so they don't come to Europe. And while we could criticize and, 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 and not appreciate, not feel good about that motivation, it didn't make huge policy shift. It meant the development agency started to get involved in this space. And there, since that time, uh, there has been a great increase in funding opportunities and development action to help hosting communities improve their institutions and their service delivery for their own nationals, as well as for um, refugees and internally displaced persons. And I think that's probably the most significant policy shift we've, I've seen in, in, in my career. And it's leading to different approaches in how we deliver education services, health programs, and also how we approach livelihoods. This, this part of the book highlights the literature on the economic impact of refugees and IDPs on hosting communities. And it's a fascinating, um, there, there's, these, these studies are fascinating and also what they reveal. So um, that's the part four. And part five, acknowledging that I've just mentioned what I think is the biggest policy shift in, in, in at least 30 or 40 years, and this being the merging of humanitarian and development assistance. Part five looks at what are, what's underpinning a lot of this positive shift. Um, and one of it are new financing instruments. Humanitarian financing, which has been the chief source of uh, support for refugees over and NIDPs over many years, is now being linked more firmly with development programs to create more sustainable, not emergency relief, but more sustained relief over time. And um, that's been dramatic. Private sector has come on stream very resolutely, so there's a lot more private sector funding in this space, as well as innovative financing mechanisms. The other major development has been great advances on improving our knowledge base, our data, our analysis, and our assessments. Um, we have been, as international organizations, very good at uh, knowing the numbers of populations. UNHCR keeps detailed registration data, so we know individual characteristics, but we've been quite weak on knowing socioeconomic characteristics and vulnerabilities of both displaced communities and the communities in which they live, which is really critical information to know how you shape policy and how you design programs to benefit both. And that, with the development support, is changing how our statistical base. And now we also have open source information, which is wonderful for academic research. And we are also investing more time into assess impact assessments. International agencies have been very good at saying to donors, thank you very much for your money. Here's what we did with it. We did what we planned. But we've been very weak at knowing whether or not our planned interventions have had the desired effect. And now with the growth of impact evaluations, we are being able to be held account appropriately for the impact of, the, of um, our interventions and being able then to alter and change them to meet, um, to meet the results of those assessments. And finally, I'd say the partnership space is also dramatically changed. It's incredible. The number of 
partners now that are dedicated to improving responses to forced displacement. And I have to here acknowledge that persons with displacement experience, refugees and internally displaced people have been marginalized for many years as the international regime grew and expanded. But their voice is now acknowledged and needs to be heard, not just because it's morally right, but because it's also more effective to have them identify what their needs are, to have them help to deliver programs to the local community, and for have them help to assess the results of those programs and be engaged in policy dialogue. The same is true for local authorities. Um, we also have cities that have banded together, which provide supportive networks for each other. The private sector, in addition to its funding arm, has brought its innovative approaches to help us improve access to education, remote learning, for example, access to internet, cell phone coverage, innovative approaches to shelter and, and, and heating and the like. And the other area that I think might interest a lot of you is the growth in academic literature. This space used to be this used to be really the preview of legal academics and uh, policy and political science and also um, sociology. But now we have economists coming, economists coming full stream on this in this space, a lot of more interesting information on specific to education, specific to shelter, and specific to health. And this is this is hugely important in my view. So and the finally um, in terms of responses to forced displacement, the book wouldn't have been complete if we didn't look how do we hold persons who are responsible for forced displacement to account. And so the last part of the book looks at the record on international criminal prosecutions. It's been a mixed one. There's been some excellent prosecutions. And then, for example, the International Criminal Court has been a disappointment. It looks at the constraints to national criminal prosecutions. Both prosecutions of nationals or crimes created within the country concern. But as well, and this is, I think, one of the most um, positive aspects, is the growth of universal uh, juris use of jur universal jurisdiction, which I think many of you know, um, where a state assumes responsibility to criminally prosecute a crime that did not occur on its territory or by its citizens. And I think there's 146 states that have passed legislation allowing their national courts to do this. And I believe in 2021, there was something like 125 new cases launched globally. So this is really a, a very important development. So if I were just to try to sum up, um, because I think my time is up, um, uh, <laughs> the message of the book is overall, it's been a positive trajectory, but it's definitely a new dimension. International burden and responsibility sharing, which is a core objective of the International Convention relating to the status of refugees has never, um, has always fallen short. Most of the burden of, and, and responsibilities for forcibly displaced persons are borne by the low and middle income countries. The right of forcibly displaced persons to contribute to their own well-being and their own futures has been always acknowledged, but it rarely happens in practice. And humanitarian assistance, which upon which the international responses have relied and national responses has consistently fallen short. But the positive changes, again, to reiterate, in my view, are the joined up humanitarian development responses, the wider array of partners, and the increasing efforts to hold perpetrators to account. But I, I, I don't want to leave too rosy a picture, and I do have to. Um, outline what I think are some of the key challenges. Political will is big. Um, you've got to sustain political interest in order to keep these, these new approaches alive. And that's being challenged these days. Uh, prolonged conflict and the growth of um, extremist armed groups and terrorist groups who occupy large swaths of areas where international or, um, forcibly displaced persons are located. These areas are not appropriate for development assistance, and they're often very difficult for humanitarians to reach and to support. Climate events are adding uh, another new dramatic dimension to the uh, map of forced displacement. 
Trafficking, combating trafficking and human smuggling is an international priority, and rightly so. These are run by massive international criminal gangs. But what that means is that the greater surveillance and obstacles there are internationally to, 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 the, um, smuggling, to smuggling, it means that these groups that are well funded find more um, trickier and dangerous routes to, to find their trade on. And those risks are borne by the lives lost by many, many displaced persons. And COVID has also been, um, had a huge impact on the space because there has been a great loss of development gains in, especially in middle and low income communities. And that means that resources need to shift and they are shifting as, as um, is the case with the conflict in Ukraine. So while this development support to host communities and forcibly displaced persons was very um, prevalent five years ago, it is losing its visibility in light of these competing priorities, which for me um, it is a worrying sign, but it also demands of us that we make sure that our programs that we deliver are effective, efficient, deliver the desired impact and their benefit to forcibly displaced persons as well as the communities that, that host them. Well, there you have it. What a, a remarkable overview of a very, very important book. Um, I want to uh, underscore Cal has the link to the book in, in the chat function, so it's there. Um, for, for so it's a very, very rich book. And we will have four commentators now uh, giving their perspective and their wisdom on the book. Before I turn it over to our four commentators, I just want to acknowledge the students that have been so helpful. We have um, here Julian Schmidt, who's helping us with the sale of the books online. You have Fatima Amir, who is uh, doing a uh, summary, an overview of this event for the IHRP Rights Review. Um, so I'm very pleased that there will be some. Uh, developments after this actual meeting. Now, we have four commentators, um, remarkable commentators, all from very, very different perspectives. Aaron Simpson, um, Professor Y.Y. Chen, uh, Professor Giselle Harris, and Professor Ben Hampson, who's joining us virtually from Ottawa. I'll start by introducing Aaron Simpson. She's a partner here in Toronto at the law firm Landings that specializes in refugee and immigration law. She graduated with honors from this law school in the Ferrara Supreme Court. Erin serves on the national executive of the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers and is chair of its litigation committee. She currently acts as counsel to Amnesty International, the Canadian Council for Refugees, in the Canadian Council of Churches in a legal challenge to the safe third country agreement that the Canadian uh, Supreme Court considered earlier this fall. She acts as a most innovative counsel for a private sponsorship group of which my husband and I are part, supporting an Afghan family to come to Canada as part of the government's Operation Afghan Safety Program. So it's a particular pleasure to introduce Erin. She's remarkable in many, many respects, but certainly in her creativity and how she deals with every single refugee to whom she serves. Over to you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm going to jump off of point two on this uh, summary. Is the microphone okay? It has a. Yeah, everyone can hear me. Okay. Thank you so much for that uh, warm introduction and very generous, uh, Professor Cook. 
Uh, it is very lovely to be back here, although it is unrecognizable from uh, when I was a student, <laughs> uh, where the classrooms were not nearly so spacious and fancy. Uh, I am very grateful for the opportunity to uh, speak on this panel because it gave me an opportunity to really dig into the book. Uh, which in the day-to-day -day hustle of practice, we don't always get time to do. So I appreciate the invitation. I'm particularly grateful for the broad perspective uh, that the book uh, brings. As a refugee lawyer here in Canada, I am mostly day-to-day -day, uh, working with people who are here already, although we do uh, often do uh, sponsorships and bring people in. But most of my work day to day is with people who are here already. They're trying to defend their rights to remain. They're trying to establish that they have a right to remain. They're trying to check all the right boxes, meet all the right criteria, present the right document, maybe say the right thing in the right tone of voice at the right time with the right smile, without any aversion of gaze, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so the sharp focus uh, in my work is always really the tremendous toll of managed migration uh, and the tremendous toll of borders and of the concept of citizenship in people's actual day-to-day -day lives. I find that reading the book really helps sort of put that on its head a little bit and put a focus on the broader refugee protection project, on the inherent difficulties of it, on how radical the thinking is behind it actually. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that's a helpful reminder and a helpful uh, approach and probably makes us all better at doing our jobs with a sort of longer term uh, goal, um, and maybe less frustration at the way that the Canada Border Services Agency <laughs> runs its operation. Uh, one of the themes and the, the, the one that I'll focus in on that really uh, stood out to me was the uh, second point in uh, Nanette's uh, summary, which is the point about uh, sort of responsibility sharing and, and burden sharing and the tendency of uh, upper income countries like Canada to find ways of erecting barriers and avoiding responsibilities for refugees. So the story of Canada's role in refugee protection, while there are many aspects to be very proud of and that have changed a lot of people's lives for the better. It's also a story about erecting barriers and uh, you know, actively avoiding uh, responsibility. And so I'm going to focus in, in this very brief, I saw a scary looking sign that Tal has that says, stop talking. <laughs> um, so I will focus very briefly on three ways uh, that Canada erects barriers in order to avoid uh, protection. So I'm gonna cover a few aspects on the law itself as written. I'll, I'll cover a few aspects on the interpretation of the law as, as, as given to it in the courts. And then I'll just end really quickly with a few uh, comments on how the law is administered by the various administrative agencies. So uh, we'll see how far I get. Uh, the, first, uh, the first area is the law itself as written. So Canada in uh, the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act has uh, a section that deals with ineligibility which is a very clear blanket bar on the capacity to even seek refugee protection. So this means if you're ineligible to claim refugee protection in Canada, you, you don't get to go to the Immigration and Refugee Board, you don't get to convince anyone that you are in fact a refugee, you are ineligible to make that claim. Uh, the biggest uh, and most problematic in my suspicion uh, ineligibilities uh, stem from uh, the way that Canada has approached uh, claimants who come here from the United States. Uh, uh, in the introduction, uh, Professor Cook mentioned the Safe Third Country Agreement, uh, which is uh, uh, both an agreement that we have with the United States, but also a provision in our law that says, if you approach Canada and you're already in the United States and you're at a land border, at an official point of entry, you are in eligible. You can't make a refugee claim. If it doesn't matter to us what type of what you might be fleeing. You, you cannot make that refugee claim. 
the Canada-US border. And then a second companion piece that was introduced uh, more recently uh, by the Trudeau government, uh, which makes an individual ineligible to make a refugee claim if they previously claimed protection in the United States or one of the uh, other four countries with which Canada has information sharing agreements, so sort of five eyes countries. These ineligibilities apply regardless of whether or not the, the country in which the individual is situated or um, a, you know, has claimed protection previously has a taken a definition or an interpretation of the refugee convention that actually excludes them from protection or is restrictive of them. So the best examples uh, from the United States are uh, the United States has a very restrictive uh, interpretation of uh, what a convention refugee is with respect to uh, gender-based persecution. So women fleeing uh, domestic violence, well, Canada has actually, the Immigration Refugee Board in Canada has had a, uh, an interpretation of the convention, sorry, an interpretation of the protection needs of women in that situation that is consistent with the convention. The United States does not. It's been broadly, broadly condemned. And yet, when a woman uh, comes up to the Canada-US border seeking protection for gender-based violence, she still returned to the United States and told them they could claim there, regardless of the fact that she doesn't actually have access to protection there. Uh, there's a, a number of other uh, sort of elements to that that are also problematic and essentially mean that people who have genuine needs for refugee protection are just still being told you're ineligible to claim here because you're in the United States or you have already claimed in the United States. So ineligibilities are a big one and they are a sort of a black and white situation in terms of being able to seek refugee protection. There's also uh, inadmissibility uh, in the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. Uh, inadmissibilities frequently deal with people who are a threat to, or who are deemed to be a threat to Canadian security, or who have been involved in criminality or human rights abuses. Uh, one of the clearest examples of how this concept is overused to erect barriers to refugee protection is in the matter of people who have had a membership in any kind of an organization that uh, either has tried to overthrow a government or is deemed to be a terrorist group. And a member in an organization like that can include anybody, regardless of how minor their role was, uh, regardless of whether or not they were doing it by choice. So the case law in Canada is replete with individuals. Uh, the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers, actually, which uh, Professor Cook mentioned, is currently involved in litigation before the federal court challenging one of the provisions of the Immigration Refugee Protection Act. Uh, in light of a young man's situation who uh, his father had put out uh, in the family store a box raising money for this self-determination group, and he worked in the store. So that's his membership in a group that poses a threat to the national security of Canada um, in, the, in, the, in the family store. So the, the case law is, is replete with uh, similar types of, of examples. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, provisions that deal with what's called cessation, uh, which is when an individual, even who has been here as a permanent resident, uh, the, the, the government has a very broad scope to bring uh, what's called a cessation proceeding against them if they have done anything that could be constituted, sort of, which could be characterized as reavailing themselves of the protection of their country of origin or whether they have the right to protection. So, that can include uh, obtaining a passport, uh, traveling there to see a dying parent, uh, whatever it is. So these are, again, other examples of in the law uh, barriers that are erected. How much time do I have left? Okay. Uh, the second big uh, uh, category I want to cover briefly is the interpretation of the law that has been uh, given in both the, uh, the tribunals and in the courts uh, to refugee status uh, determination questions uh, and, and the ways in which that interpretation also erects barriers and, and avoids responsibility. 
Uh, one very significant one, thank you, uh, which uh, anyone familiar with the refugee case law in Canada will know is the requirement of no uh, internal flight alternatives. So, or, or commonly known as an IFA. So in the refugee uh, in the convention, the definition is that somebody faces a risk of persecution in all areas of the country. And in Canada and, and in other countries that has been turned into a distinct uh, component of the legal test for refugee in which the onus is on the refugee claimant to show that they face a, still face the same risk that they have proven that they face uh, in this particular city. So I was just at the Immigration Refugee Board on Tuesday with a family from Mexico who had been actively pursued by one of the major uh, uh, cartels uh, for a two year period. The board is satisfied that the cartel came after them, they had to flee, they face a real risk. But then at the very beginning of the, of the, uh, of the hearing, the uh, adjudicator says, you know, the issue on the table here is internal flight alternative. And I'm going to give you three cities where I think you might be able to relocate. And that's what happens right at the beginning of the hearing where you get, here's the three cities that you need to play whack-a-mole with and try to convince me that even though you face a risk and you've already convinced me that the state of Mexico is not in any position to protect you and that these cartels are running the place, I want you to convince me that you couldn't specifically go to Acapulco. Um, so this is, again, uh, I think in the interpretation a means by which uh, Canada does uh, exclude and avoid uh, responsibility. There is um, much more to say about interpretation, so I'll just put a pin in that to say there's a lot about the interpretation of the definition that does uh, you know, serve to avoid responsibility. Uh, but I do briefly want to mention that uh, the interpretation uh, of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms has also been uh, a major obstacle. And that was very much on display when we were before the Supreme Court earlier this month, um, dealing with the constitutional challenge to the Safe Country Agreement. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, the Supreme Court recognized the rights of refugees under Section 7 of the Charter in 1985 in the Singh decision. And since that time, uh, both the Federal Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court have written a number of decisions that uh, uh, constrain and restrict uh, those rights uh, as, uh, uh, in very dramatic ways. And we may well see, uh, uh, we'll have to see how, how this most recent uh, decision turns out where the, the issue is again squarely before the court. Uh, but that's, it's very inconsistent with the evolution of Section 7 in other areas of law um, and a real carve out um, for people who are non-citizens. Finally, um, great. <laughs> Finally, I'll just speak very briefly about the administration of the law by the administrative agencies. So both Immigration Refugee Citizenship Canada and the Canada Border Services Agency, which are tasked with uh, the administration of the act. Um, the strategy for a long time has been quite expressly uh, pushing the border out. So that means Canada is in this unique position of only having a land border with the United States and then already having this extraordinarily restrictive agreement with the United States under the Safe Third Country Agreement. So Canada's approach to keeping refugees out and therefore to avoiding responsibility is at that land border, we've got the STCA, and then the uh, CDSA strategy is ensure that, that the, the same approach is essentially, well, that as much of the approach as is possible can be taken at embassies, at airports, at all other parts, ports, where an individual may attempt to enter Canada. So that is uh, in the determination of uh, visa applications. Uh, where very much you see anybody who's got any affiliation with anybody who is a refugee here in Canada is very unlikely to be granted a visa, um, even you know, with families who need to be reunited. And uh, it also deals just very specifically with interdiction. So 
uh, CBSA officers, liaison officers in airports around the world who will uh, note someone who even has a visa or has you know, a visa exemption to enter Canada who will be uh, removed from the lineup and, uh, before they can get onto Canadian soil where Canada's uh, convention obligations will be triggered. Uh, I think those were the main points I wanted to make. Um, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Erin, uh, that's very sobering uh, um, perspective from a practicing lawyer in this area. Um, I want to acknowledge here in the room members of the private support group, and I also want to link that up um, with what uh, more positively Lynette in her book talked about the private uh, sponsorship program and what Canada has done. I, I gather it's one of the more uh, country that has done the most with private sponsorship programs. And also in this regard, um, Professor Audrey Macklin, who unfortunately couldn't be here today due to a conflict, she herself is doing uh, work looking at the effectiveness of the private sponsorship program. Um, and that promises to be uh, some very important research. Now I wanna introduce Professor Y.Y. Y. Chen. Um, He's a graduate of this law school and now teaches health law, constitutional law, immigration and refugee law at the University of Ottawa uh, Common Law section. He's also a trained social worker and as such brings a socio-legal perspective to his research that critically examines the health inequities facing non-citizens and racialized minorities. Professor Chen is clearly breaking new ground with his research on the challenges that refugees face in accessing necessary health care. He acts as co-counsel for the Charter Committee on Refugee Issues in the pending and very significant Tuzan case that concerns access of non-citizens to health care in Canada. It's gratifying to welcome Professor Chen, my former student, um, back to the law school to provide his insights in the book, Professor Jen. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Becca, for that very uh, generous remarks. Um, it's always great to be back um, at, at the University. Toronto. Um, I echo uh, Aaron's comment that I really don't recognize the, <laughs> the faculty um, anymore um, because it's such um, an airy and bright space <laughs> that we're in. Um, but it's, it's again nice to connect with uh, dear old friends and make uh, new connections. Um, again, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to make a few remarks about the book. Uh, and I'm truly honored. Uh, Lynette, as I've said to you before, uh, your previous book, Making of the Men's Mosaic, truly one of the books I cite all the time uh, in my own work. Um, and, and I've assigned as, as a reading for my students uh, to read. So congratulations on the publication of yet another excellent and timely book. Um, I, I know that uh, they will enjoy much success just um, as your previous work. Uh, for today, I've been invited to specifically uh, reflect on the section in the book. So it's a small section in the book that um, discusses healthcare in the forced um, migration context. Like other parts of the book, I find the discussion relating to health truly informative and thought provoking. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Lynette, I hope you don't mind me putting my own spin on your work. Uh, but I really like how you structure uh, your discussions in this section, almost along two interrelated axes. Um, and so following along one axis, you first set out the historical background on how health interventions for uh, the forcibly, uh, forcibly displaced persons used to look like back in the 1960s and, and um, all the way to the 1990s. And you show 
how it has evolved right, from a focus on food assistance and prevention of diseases inside of the camps uh, to the present consensus, which you've talked about, uh, of an inclusive healthcare um, in the displacement situation, uh, where healthcare delivery for the force, forcefully displaced is integrated into um, the existing public healthcare system for, uh, of the, uh, the, the host country. So that's one axis. Then along the other axis, um, you talked about how the kind of health issues that healthcare providers working with the forcibly uh, displaced persons are called upon to address. Right? Those have also um, evolved over time. Right? Moving from really a focus on emergency response um, to the adoption of this primary care model uh, which over time has placed more emphasis on things like sexual reproductive health, on mental health, and specialized care for non communicable uh, diseases. And so by layering those two axes on top of each other, I think it did such an impressive job, truly, um, of showing the readers the complexity involved in addressing the health needs of the forcefully uh, displaced and the ingenuity of um, those who are working with this population um, to problem solve and to improve the system. Now I'm going to turn to my substantive comments, and I actually have three that I want to make today. I want to acknowledge from the get go that my comments reflect my own positioning right? as somebody who worked mainly. Um, with the forcefully displaced persons inside a high income country like Canada. And so as, as you heard from the net, this really represents only a small subset of the forcefully displaced people around the world. Uh, but I hope that by bringing forward this perspective, perhaps we can add further nuances to the discussion about um, health of the forcefully displaced. So my first comment um, has to do with the observation that I already mentioned, which is that in recent years, um, healthcare for the forcibly displaced has emphasized this integrated service delivery um, through national systems. I agree with the approach and certainly the thinking uh, behind this. Right? As I understand it, uh, the rationale for favoring this integrated approach over having parallel health systems, one for the locals and one uh, for the forcibly displaced, is that, well, for one thing, there is um, really no real reason for a duplicate system when we know that the health needs of the forcibly displaced actually converge with um, the local population over time. Moreover, seeing as more and more of the forcibly displaced people actually live among the local communities as opposed to inside camps. Having parallel health systems is just unsustainable over time. Not to mention having an integrated approach leads to economies of scale, which can make healthcare delivery for the forcibly displaced more cost effective. Now, notwithstanding these advantages, I wonder how the integrated approach may be actually perceived uh, by the local communities. Um, rightly or wrongly, uh, may it add to the public perception in the host communities that the forced uh, displaced persons are actually taking precious resources away from them. Um, and certainly here in Canada, this is a common allegation that we see, right? and, an allegation that we often need to proactively guard against uh, whenever we are advocating any kind of uh, improvement to refugee health care. Another question that I have about this integrated approach concerns the level of integration that is actually required um, to reap the benefit that we expect to gain. Is simply including 
the forcibly displaced persons in host um, countries' healthcare delivery system enough? Or should the financing of such healthcare also be integrated? Allow me to just elaborate on my, my question. So as many of you know, here in Canada, healthcare for the forcibly displaced, so including refugees, asylum seekers, and those um, who have been uh, trafficked, they're integrated into the broader healthcare system in the sense that individuals enjoy government financed healthcare coverage. And through uh, such coverage, they can access healthcare from the same set of providers, just like <coughs> everyone else. However, the source of healthcare coverage for the forcibly displaced um, persons here in Canada differs uh, from others. So whereas healthcare coverage for most residents in Canada are provided and largely funded by provinces and territories, healthcare coverage for the forcibly displaced persons, those are mentioned, is funded by the federal government exclusively through the Infant Federal Health Program or the IMHP. Now this dichotomy has been criticized by many, me included, right? because it quite literally sets the forcibly displaced persons apart from the rest of the population. Although an asylum seeker, for example, could go to the same healthcare service providers as you and I who care, the very fact that um, they are presenting with an IFHP document instead of a provincial health card has been a source of a really serious healthcare barrier for these populations. Uh, many service providers are simply unfamiliar with or unwilling to work with um, the IHP and have turned away IHP beneficiaries for that reason. And others are known to have charged IHP beneficiaries for an additional fee at the point of service delivery, which is a practice, as we know, that's not permitted, right? If the same service providers are treating anyone else through our provincial health insurance program. So all this prompted um, some calls here in Canada to integrate the financing for refugee healthcare into the provincial and territorial health insurance programs. And hence my question to you, Nanette, um, namely, for an integrated approach to truly uh, be more effective, equitable, and sustainable um, than a parallel system, is integration of healthcare delivery alone enough? Or should there be deeper integration, right? Perhaps integration of financing as well. So that's a very long winded first comment. <laughs> Um, the, the second comment I would like to make um, has to do with another form of inclusivity that you mentioned in this part of the book. And that is the inclusion of forcefully displaced uh, persons in host communities' healthcare uh, workforce. So in the book, Lynette, um, you talked about how um, engaging forcefully displaced people in public health efforts is valuable for both the host communities and for the forced uh, displaced groups as, uh, um, alike. Now, one of the examples that you gave in the book was Canada's reliance on refugee and asylum seeking healthcare workers in um, the country's response to the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. I agree with you completely about the importance of engaging forcibly displaced people in our health interventions um, and, and to really value the, uh, the skills and, and, and knowledge that, that they bring to the table. But part of me wonder whether we can properly ca characterize Canada's uh, dependence on refugee and asylum seeking healthcare workers during the first wave of uh, the pandemic in that light. Um, there are many who would argue that you know, what Canada did was simply a continuation of a longstanding practice of 
using precarious status migrants to do the kind of work that Canadians are reluctant to do, at least not without any better working conditions or better pay than the status quo. So viewed that way, the forcefully displaced persons are not working in Canada's health sector because we genuinely value uh, what they have to offer, but because we can take a bit, uh, advantage of them right, as disposable labor. Um, and, and I think this criticism, to some extent, is borne out in the fact that the forcefully displaced persons that have worked on the front lines accounted for a significant portion of the positive COVID cases during the first waves of um, the pandemic and the inadequate protection that we provide them um, actually uh, speaks volumes to me anyway for Canada's indifference towards them. And, and so, so really the question I have for you Nanette, is I would love to hear your thoughts about how we can walk this fine line of engaging the forcibly displaced persons in the host communities in our healthcare sector while ensuring that this kind of engagement doesn't really veer into the territory of this quotation. And I'm going to make the, my very last comment in the remaining uh, minute that I have. So much of the discussion um, about health in this part of the book concerns forced displacement in lower and middle income countries. And in those settings, as one would expect, the scope of healthcare interventions that may be available is constrained by a shortage of resources. And we see emergency and um, primary care being prioritized as a result. But what about high income countries where resources um, or at least the constraint on the resources is not arguably not as um, serious. And so, for example, healthcare coverage for asylum seekers is currently varied across high income countries. Um, some, like here in Canada, we offer, at least on paper, uh, asylum seekers a level of healthcare coverage that is comparable to those received by citizens. Sweden, on the other hand, um, adult asylum seekers are only eligible for emergency treatment and what they call care that cannot be referred. And so should there be a uniform standard uh, to refugee healthcare in high income countries? And if so, what should that standard look like? So Nanette, given your expertise on the subject, I very much welcome your insight into those questions. So that really concludes my remarks. Thank you very much. Professor Chen has given me lots to comment on. <laughs> uh, I should say that uh, uh, Nanette is going to comment after um, everybody uh, gives their perspectives on the book. Um, uh, Professor Chen, thank you so much for that uh, very clear um, presentation. I should mention in the book, one of the, the encouraging signs um, that's happened in this area, as Nanette points out, in the past 20 years, the increase in research on refugee issues generally has increased um, many, many times. Um, but I have to point out that Professor Chen will still need your research in this particular area because I don't think though that increase of research is really related in any significant way to the issue of healthcare or displaced persons access. So it's a pleasure to have you here, and it will be a pleasure to watch the kind of research that you pursue during your work. So now we are very fortunate to have uh, Professor Giselle Perez. She's, as been said, is a visiting scholar, a scholar at risk here at the law school and the uh, law school of global affairs. She's a constitutional law expert and has served as the first ombudsman in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan from 2019 to 2021. She was the first woman to lead the law enforcement institution within the legal sector of that government, where she was tasked with a difficult challenge of um, investigating allegations of corruption 
among the top levels of the Afghan government, but an insignificant undertaking. She was the only female member of the Afghan Independent Commission for overseeing the implementation of the Afghan Constitution. She holds degrees from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London and Kabul University, and has taught for 10 years at the American University of Afghanistan. Perhaps most importantly for us, um, Giselle witnessed in the refugee, first in Pakistan before she returned to join the previous uh, Af Afghan government. And then after that government fell, um, her experience as a, a refugee here in Canada. Um, so we are very fortunate to have the benefit of her wisdom and perspective on this book, Giselle Valentin. A very kind introduction, um, and it's really my pleasure uh, to be here. Um, but I have to admit, I am not a refugee law uh, scholar or expert, um, so uh, it's it's a privilege to be among these distinguished panelists, and uh, not just to share my experience, but also I have already learned a great deal um, just sitting in this panel and listening to the um, panelists today. Um, Basically, when I, when I was reading uh, the book, um, I think this panel as well gave me a chance to read the book. Um, I think I'm also one of those people who have a long list of books that I have to read, but then eventually you don't get the time. So opportunities like this help you uh, to read uh, some very great books. And, and, and this book that I read, um, uh, where People Forced to Flee, was one of those great books where I kept reading and um, while reading the book, I, because I've been a refugee myself, there's, there's a lot that has changed my life because of becoming a refugee. Um, I felt heard, uh, I felt spoken for. Um, and it was um, great to see that we are talking from so many different aspects. We're not just talking about history, but also looking at how history should help us learn and how history should help us um, do things differently. Um, I, I learned a great deal, um, um, and as well as uh, it gave me a lot of uh, food for thought to um, think about, uh, especially now that I am struggling with, with um, starting a new career all over again um, um, uh, after coming to Canada. So yes, it was great. Thank you, Nanette. Um, thank you, Professor Cope, for giving me that opportunity. Now, um, as um, Professor Cook mentioned, um, I have become refugee twice in my life. Um, in 1992, um, the Civil War broke in Afghanistan, um, and, um, and then in 2021, just last year, um, the Taliban took over the country, um, and I had to, both the times, we had to, we were forced um, to leave the country. Um, the first time when we left the country, I was um, only 12. Um, and um, uh, we left the country with a pair of clothes. I seriously didn't have uh, much of an idea what exactly was happening. Uh, but I knew that my family was concerned um, with our safety and security and our education. These were their priorities and um, they wanted to make sure my parents have three children and they want to make sure um, the children are in a better stage. But more importantly, they were concerned about me because I was the only daughter, I was 12. Um, I was pretty high in my height uh, for my age and um, women were at risk um, during that uh, civil war period. So they're more concerned about me uh, being there, and um, that was the reason, one of the major reasons why we left. Um, going to Pakistan, um, we were in a very uh, specific situation because uh, we were not living in the camps, so we did not get uh, support from UNHCR, um, and at the same time, the government was not providing support. But worse than that was the fact that um, people like my family did not have any 
mission to work. Um, and um, we were um, um, constantly, my, my, my father for, uh, in particular was constantly um, uh, worried uh, for being harassed by the police um, um, for, for a variety of reasons um, and, and none, um, that, that we didn't have any sort of documents that would actually uh, give us any kind of protection under the state. So I finished my school, my high school for specific schools that were for refugees in Pakistan. But when um, I was ready to go to the university and I did um, go through the entry exam, but in my first month of the university, the then government of Taliban, um, this is 1998, um, asked the government of Pakistan to shut down the universities for the refugees. So my education stopped um, after the high school. And um, it took me, like, I, I restarted my education five years later when I returned back to Afghanistan. Uh, so being, um, growing up as a refugee, you don't only have this, you know, this identity crisis, but at the same time, um, um, as, as a young, as a child, as a young person, you are in constant uh, struggle of, of at least finding your way towards an education system. We couldn't go to Pakistani schools because we had not gone through the Pakistani schooling education, high schools, and so we couldn't go to the Pakistani university. So these were all um, extremely complicated. Now, um, there are millions of people um, who um, have, have become refugees um, um, at that point in time, but in 2001, uh, when things changed in Afghanistan, we had the opportunity to go back. Again, millions of people repatriated, they voluntarily went back to the country. And I think that gave all of us, um, um, we had a lot of hope, but also we found ourselves um, at, at, at a, uh, with an opportunity to, um, uh, to grow, to develop, and to do things that we could not do um, back as a refugee. Like I remember when I first went to Afghanistan, we had a lot of issues. We didn't have electricity. Our house had extremely limited resources. Uh, at that point in time, 2002, internet was a big thing. And in Afghanistan, we didn't have internet. So there's a lot of things that I initially we had um, the luxury of as a refugee, but not in the country. But despite that, uh, we were so happy to be back because we could see that now there, there are opportunities for us. And we actually used and benefited from that, those opportunities. And I was able, when I first went to Kabul um, in, 20, uh, in 2002, I was a high school graduate. And when I left, I was the state's ombudsperson. So um, basically explaining all that to say, not, um, and, and, and this is what I see in Nenis' book as well, um, it, to say that not all refugees leave um, um, because um, they're looking for a better life. Um, they're literally forced to leave. Um, during my 20 years in Afghanistan, I had multiple opportunities. I studied in the UK, I lived in Europe, uh, but I always um, went back to the country because I thought that's where I belong and I thought that's, that's where I want to work and, and basically um, contribute um, what, I, what I can. Now, two things really struck, um, I could go on forever, uh, but um, um, two things that really uh, struck me um, in the book um, were one, um, giving refugees the agency um, and giving refugees the, um, uh, the platform um, to participate in decision-making, to be able to raise their voices and to be able to be heard. Um, I think, despite the fact that um, since uh, 1921, there has been a, a lot of work done on um, recognizing um, the right to take refuge in, in, in asylum, um, to putting more responsibility on the states. I think all of that um, have suggested and have, have even had stronger language um, to ensure that uh, people take part uh, or the refugees take part in decision-making on policies um, or in the design process of these policies that directly impact them. Uh, but I think we still see a huge gap um, when it comes to the realization um, of, um, of, 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 of such um, a goal. And um, basically when you, when you talk about um, the um, refugees, um, it's, it's important um, to also note that when you, when you include refugees in the process, um, and then it puts it very nicely. You are not so the benefits are are, are um, um, so many. One is of course they they are 
they participate in the process, they raise your voice, they, they feel ownership and they don't feel like, you know, a different kind of human being. They feel like they are normal, ordinary human beings and they're being heard and they're being considered as equal um, uh, people um, um, within the host country or within um, the other country that they are. Um, it also helps improve the uh, processes. Uh, I come from a developing country and I have seen where you do not include the people um, um, for whom you're designing the program. There are chances of failure that, that would be bound to for any program, but you usually, you can avoid waste of resources if you're talking to the right people, if you're including the right uh, people into the process and try to understand and to see the processes through their eyes. So I think that is um, an important um, thing um, to keep in mind. But then uh, the other thing is um, um, once you put the refugees um, um, into the process, um, I think it also uh, gives them the confidence, gives them um, the, um, the opportunity going forward uh, to become more effective within that society, within, within the, the um, country uh, where they're accepted. This, this is an important element because uh, a lot of the time you see countries complaining that refugees uh, are a threat to their um, uh, culture, to their economy, to their security. Um, and it's because we keep them in a way segregated, in a way separated. I think the more they're integrated, um, and to these process, I think that is that is the beginning. You you um, you help them um, integrate into that process, and then that basically paves the way for social integration of the refugees um, at a later stage. Um, um, and um, another important aspect um, that um, Lena talks about um, in the book, um, and uh, Professor Chen also talked about, is the health issues um, for the refugees. Uh, which really struck my mind, and, uh, and, all, and, and simply because I was feeling it myself, um, for myself, for my um, surroundings. Um, this time around, when I left Afghanistan, I was an adult, and the circumstances unfolded in Afghanistan literally in a matter of one to two days. Um, Taliban's capture of Afghanistan was so unexpected that nobody was ready. Um, uh, for, for leaving the country. We were not prepared. We didn't know what to do. Um, and um, we, uh, in, in, in a situation like that, of course, you are extremely stressed. Um, you are um, terrified. Um, and I've been saying that the problem with when the Taliban came to Afghanistan, the major problem for people like myself was uncertainty. We did not know uh, what will happen to us. Like if we were captured, will they kill us? Will they detain us? What will happen to our family members? We didn't know that. So you leave in that situation. Uh, you don't know if you will be able to leave. Um, there was a lot of trauma going through the airport. I think the images of the Afghanistan airports um, became very public at that point in time. Going through that process, um, then going um, to the first destination, which was Qatar, we, we went in military planes and literally people were sitting down on the floor of the plane. I had never seen a military plane before. Um, and I was stressed, but next to me, there were three children who had never been in a plane before. Um, and their mother was sitting at the end, there were four of them. Um, and they were so terrified. I was trying to like make conversation to make them feel a little um, uh, relieved. Um, but, but by the time the plane was taking off, um, this, this boy, which was probably eight years old, and I was telling him, don't worry, have you seen in cartoons and movies, it's a plane, it's going to go up. And then as the plane takes off, he holds my hand in a way because he cannot reach his mother. And one could feel the terror um, in him. So even going into a plane had its anxieties and terrors. And you end up, we ended up in, um, in Abu Dhabi uh, five days. Again, uncertainty what will happen to us. We are locked in, in, in corridors. We cannot go out. And then my office was able to get us out to Albania. There again, you spend another period of uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen to you. But at the same time, you're constantly worried about the life you've left behind. Uh, sometimes it's uh, inconceivable what refugees are going through. And a lot of the time we talk about uh, the fact that they have left because of um, danger and insecurity. But we also sometimes don't appreciate the fact that they have literally left a whole life behind. 
whether we're talking about property or access, or whether we're talking about their social networks, about the culture they have left behind. So all of that keeps coming to you, the uncertainty um, in front of you and that what you've left behind, the, the whole sense of, of loss. So I think it's extremely important that we keep that in mind um, when, when designing uh, programs for refugees, for resettlement. Um, and um, um, I, I, again, I'm not an expert on, on Canadian refugee law, and I, and I learned a lot from the panel today, but something from my own experience is that this was the mental health aspect uh, for refugees uh, was not kept into consideration when we arrived in Canada. Um, this is something that needs to be an important point of any refugee uh, program. Uh, because, um, and, and, and people have different experiences. My experience to me is extremely traumatic, but then I wonder what the experience of, of children who live in Syria would have been, probably 10 times worse than my circumstances. So every refugee's experience is different, but then in any case, they're traumatized. And sometimes the government programs, unfortunately, not only reduce the trauma and stress, but rather add to it with the bureaucracies, with, uh, with, with the uncertainties of, or, or the length of legal processes. So I really hope that that becomes an important uh, part of the uh, design process. Um, again, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity um, uh, to talk. And um, my heartfelt thanks to Lynette. Because um, as I said, um, when I was reading each part of your book, I, I felt like um, I haven't been deeply involved in it. But I really um, um, understood there's a lot going on. Uh, but to put all of that together in such a lovely way, in such an articulate manner, um, um, it was a great read, you know, read. But above all, thank you so much for the work you're doing for refugees around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle, for that very um, important perspective, um, the personal perspective of your experience as an actual refugee. Um, certainly last but not least, we have Professor Ben Hansen, who is currently the president of the World Refugee and Migration Council. He is tuning in from Ottawa um, to give his perspective. He's, um, as I said, he's currently the president of this council and the chancellor professor of international affairs at the Norman School of International Affairs at Carleton University, where he was director for 12 years. He's the author of many, many books and co-editor and co-editor of many more books, the most recent of which is just Diplomacy and the Future of the World Order. He's received many awards for his scholarship and leadership and is a frequent media commentator. Under Professor, Professor Hampson's leadership, the World Refugee and Migration Council has recently issued this report, Renewed Call to Action, uh, just uh, earlier this fall. And this too will be in the chat function. We'll have a link to it. We're very grateful to Professor Hansen for joining us virtually from Ottawa to provide his insights on this book. Professor Hansen. Fred. Uh, Fen, we can't hear you yet. So just one second. Just one second. We're just working on the sound. Can you hear me now? Yes, now. Okay. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, for that generous introduction. And I do want to um, uh, express uh, my apologies for not being uh, with you uh, in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, but I do want to uh, congratulate uh, Nanette uh, on her excellent book. It's a tour de force, uh, rich with insight into the development of the international refugee regime, uh, but also um, replete with uh, policy analysis and, uh, and prescriptions. And uh, I do want to say that uh, many of the 
uh, recommendations uh, resonate strongly with uh, the ongoing work of the World Refugee and Migration Council, which I think many of you know is chaired by uh, former uh, Canadian Foreign Minister, uh, the Honourable Lloyd Axworthy. Um, I would like to um, focus uh, my remarks on one of the things that really popped out at me and uh, uh, obviously speak to what I've been asked to do, which is the implications of this book for Canada. What really struck me reading the book uh, is that um, it has a very important message that um, if we look at uh, forcible displacement uh, in the past decade, we've seen a stepwise increase in the frequency, the speed, and the scale of forced displacement in the number of crises that have um, literally unfolded uh, on top of each other. Uh, more than 30 million uh, people displaced in the past decade, uh, over 100 million now, uh, which is close to uh, or more than 1% uh, of the world's population are refugees. Um, climate change, uh, as, uh, as uh, Nanette and some of the other uh, commentators noted, is, um, is changing the refugee and migration paradigm. And um, what's also the case is that uh, displacement uh, in the past decade is uh, the result uh, of a constellation of interrelated factors, breakdown in governance, drought, food scarcity, endemic violence in, in many countries, and uh, I needn't uh, go over the list uh, uh, for such uh, uh, an audience uh, like the, the one uh, we have now uh, 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 in, uh, uh, in Toronto. Um, well, what does this book mean for Canada? So let me start with a couple of observations. Um, our own governmental institutions have shown that they really can't cope with the growing number of refugee claimants. Even though uh, some important innovations have been introduced, uh, new IT systems to accelerate uh, the processing of refugee claimants uh, uh, and asylum seekers, uh, IRCC has got uh, some uh, new funding to uh, increase its workforce. But by the last count, uh, or my last count, there were uh, over uh, 100,000, 110,000 refugee applications waiting to be processed. 40,000 of those are for government assisted programs and another 70,000 are for uh, privately sponsored uh, refugees. And even though Canada publicly champions uh, its private sponsorship program, I think it's fair to say, you know, many private sponsors are disappointed at how long they're having to wait, uh, wait uh, for the people that um, they're prepared to sponsor. Refugees themselves uh, feel forgotten and uh, worry openly that they're end of, uh, at the end of a very long queue, uh, an immigration backlog of nearly uh, 2 million people who want to uh, migrate to Canada. Uh, some provincial governments are now saying they can't or won't take more refugees. Uh, they also want to cap the number of immigrants. They complain they don't have the resources or housing in tight uh, housing market to accommodate newcomers. In many of our biggest cities, refugees are ending up in homeless sex, uh, shelters, uh, further taxing already stretched social services. So what is the problem here? Well, public opinion shows that uh, Canadians uh, are consistently have have consistently been welcoming of newcomers, including refugees, and we've seen that in Canada's response to the Syrian crisis, strong public support uh, there for settling some fifty thousand Syrian refugees, and we've seen that um, you know in a desire to uh, bring people from uh, Afghanistan, unlimited numbers now from Ukraine. Uh, but we're not meeting, uh, other than uh, the case of Syria, we're, we're struggling to meet uh, targets that have been set. And I think, uh, and again, some of the speakers touched on it, one problem may be that security is overshadowing humanitarianism as our government agencies stri struggle to find the right balance be between uh, and among competing imperatives. Another problem is that provinces are increasingly designing their own immigration policies 
uh, but they lack the capacity to process immigrants and refugees in an efficient and humane way. In short, uh, our operational side can't keep pace with our aspirations. And this is true at all levels of government, but I would say it's also true in other sectors. Um, universities, uh, this conference is taking place in the university, and the private sector uh, should not uh, forget that they have a unique role uh, to play uh, in this space. Um, in the case of uh, the private sector, uh, refugees and other newcomers need more than handouts. They need better access to capital and credit through our financial institutions if they're going to be successful entrepreneurs and integrate themselves into the economy. Much more can be done in that regard, uh, and much more can be done in terms of the hiring of refugees and using supply chains uh, that employ refugees. Universities and colleges also have to be mindful of their special obligations to be accessible uh, to refugees uh, when it comes to uh, providing tuition, uh, social support on campus, helping with uh, professional accreditation. And those are clearly, uh, certainly when it comes to uh, accreditation, uh, provincial uh, responsibilities, uh, as is uh, the need to provide additional training uh, to meet, uh, you know, for newcomers, including refugees, to meet uh, Canadian labor market requirements. Now, the question I'd like to put is, um, do we need a wholesale review of our refugee and migration system, given uh, uh, the fact that um, we're dealing really with a, a problem or a challenge, I should say, that um, has, uh, has grown uh, exponentially at a time when, you know, Canada clearly needs to bring a lot more people uh, into uh, uh, the country and into its uh, aging uh, uh, workforce. Have we found the right balance between humanitarianism and security in the way we process refugees? Is the Immigration uh, uh, and Refugee Board, the IRB, still fit for purpose? And is there a better way to process and accelerate claims? Given the growing impact of climate change, do we need a new definition nationally of refugees, uh, recognizing that internationally it may be very hard to uh, uh, renegotiate uh, uh, the original definition in the 1951 convention? And notwithstanding uh, some of the changes that uh, were introduced in 2012 in, uh, uh, to uh, our immigration and refugee systems, uh, I think we can all agree that the system is still cumbersome and unwieldy. And, um, uh, you know, perhaps it's time to uh, establish, uh, and I hesitate to say this, but um, do we need a, a new Royal Commission that is arm's length and in a position uh, to conduct uh, such a review with a mandate, not just to review federal programs and institutions, but also to dig into the challenges that exist at the provincial, uh, municipal, and community levels. I think it's fair to say Canada could lead the world by providing uh, a new model in terms of its own practices uh, for how it deals with uh, the forcibly displaced, uh, but it's going to take real political leadership to get there. And uh, I found this book inspiring in terms of raising um, really um, uh, 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 identifying and putting its finger on the fact that we're, we're in a, a very new international environment and uh, our national institutions, right down to the local level, our capacities are not up to uh, the challenge and uh, our aspirations to be a welcoming country uh, to all those um, who are fleeing uh, violence um, and other kinds of uh, human rights uh, violations. So thank you. And Annette is going to give a few responses, starting first with uh, Professor Hansen's uh, suggestions on where Canada might think about going, and then uh, responding specifically to uh, each of the commentators on the book. So, Nanette, over to you, and then we'll open it up for questions and maybe discussion among the panel. Um, we have several people here that I'm sure have further insights on this issue. 
over to you. Great, thank you very much. And I, I say admittedly that I, I'm starting off by not having examined Canadian immigration policy for about 10 years. And the book that Michael and I, or the study that Michael Trudelko and I are engaging in now is to really look at contemporary Canadian immigration policy. So a lot of the things that have been raised today, um, I'm very grateful they've been raised. And I'm going to come back to all the panelists because on, on many of the points that you raise, you know way more than I do at this point. But let me just say a few general things about the hist about the implications of the international um, situation today in Canada. And I think there are some implications for Canada. And one is that we really need to be um, very clear about our own history. We tend to speak um, very glowingly about ourselves and we are a nation of immigrants and we have welcomed immigrants and all the rest. But um, for most of our history, it was an overtly, specifically exclusionary racist policy well into the 1960s. Ruth came down to me today and told me she wrote uh, her thesis on this many, many years ago. Right, Ruth? And yes. it's true. And I think we need a little humility at times when we're talking about our, our track record. It, the same, I would say, is true for our contributions internationally. Um, there is a large support for immigration. There's a large support for refugees in Canada, and that is really something to feel very good about. I think our multicultural policy, the immigration, the integration assistance we paid, um, we helped, um, we gave to refugees and immigrants in times gone by were really helpful in, in creating this very robust multicultural community today, which I think the Stats Canada reports were suggested that uh, one quarter of the Canadian pop population were or are landed immigrants. So that's, that's an interesting statistic. But at the time, at the same time, our contributions to refugee and refugee um, asylum are relatively modest on the international scale. And we need to keep that in mind. Um, Aaron has talked very forcefully about all the things that we do in our application of our own asylum system to limit and to restrict access to it, which need to be taken seriously. Um, we've also heard very positive things about the Canadian private sponsorship um, uh, mechanism, which is very positive. It's brought in thousands of refugees and the support from the public has been really important to their integration. But let's also keep in mind that our numbers of accepting refugee are relatively modest compared to the rest of the world. And we should not, my view is, it's great to have private sponsorship, but it should not come at the expense of a higher proportion of our annual immigration target being also resettled refugees. And that has, the government commitment to that has been declining over the years. And I think that's something that we really need to address. Alongside of that has been, and, and, uh, and you probably refer to this, and I, I probably know more about it than I do, but what I'm hearing is that the settlement assistance that the federal government provides to provinces and to refugees has also been declining. And that's just doesn't bode well for the future because we do know that initial integration assistance does help in terms of positive outcomes for the future. And so that's another thing that needs to be looked at. In regard to um, another lesson for Canada is, and again, I'm not that well versed in how we spend our development dollars. I can say, though, that many years ago, in the 1960s, Les Lester Pearson, as you may remember, led a commission that recognized that recommended an international standard among wealthy countries of 0.7% of, at that time, it was gross national product. Now it's gross national income be dedicated to development. And only a handful of countries have ever met that goal. Canada has, to my knowledge, never met it. And right now I think we're at 0.3% of GNI. And that tells us something about our commitment to international development that I think also needs to be looked at. Um, in terms of how we spend our development dollars, this new linking of development and humanitarian assistance to help hosting communities is really important, but I did mention it needs political will, and that means that in our own development programs, Canada needs to stay the course on that and ensure that our investment and be willing to engage in the difficult discussions that often take place and are time consuming with hosting governments for more inclusive service delivery with appropriate development response to incentivize that. 
And it is much easier to give humanitarian dollars than to stay the course on long-term development financing. So that's another lesson that I think uh, we can draw, as well as the need for us to support, support and insist on, ever, on efforts that um, are making the data upon which we assess programs much more rigorous than they have been in the past. And another point I'd raise is that I think this country could do a lot more in terms of promoting international public service. Um, other countries have junior professional officer programs that place young professionals in international institutions. They really support that stream in a very um, aggressive way. And it's wonderful because the students, like it's like what the International Human Rights Law Program does, but it's taken to a national level. And the young professionals get wonderful experience, but they're also ambassadors for their country and they bring back valuable knowledge um, back home. Now, to the specific questions, because I don't want to go over my time. Again, I'm very grateful to Erin for raising for me some of the interpretive difficulties that are being developed. And I think it's really important. And this trajectory of, of the very limited charter reach has been um, brewing for about 20 years, and it needs to be addressed head on. Um, why, why, I you are so kind um, when you're talking about uh, the focus of the healthcare um, part of my um, of, of the book, um, but he also illuminates a serious gap, which is most of that discussion in the book is about low income and middle income countries. Um, in part, I tried to be a balance throughout the book, but on the medical side, it was really where on those issues were where most of the world's uh, refugees and IDPs lie. So should there be common financing here in Canada? I really defer to you for that. And I will be back to you because Michael and I will also need to know, um, have a good answer for that ourselves. I think the reliance on temporary workers uh, sheds light on, in healthcare, sheds light on a larger problem and a larger vulnerability. I believe now among our economic stream, which is by far the largest immigration stream, the majority are temporary workers, which begs the question, why are they temporary if we seem to need them so much? So I'd like to come back to you on that. And should there be a standard, um, a common standard of inclusion into healthcare services, services at public expense across high income countries? I don't know, but I do think that everything has to be context specific. So I think trying to find a common standard across different contexts will always be difficult and countries will be persuaded by evidence of what is in their best interest to do. So if we have evidence that that kind of inclusion yields better health outcomes, not just for displaced, but also the communities in which these people are, a disease doesn't know boundaries, then that may be more persuasive. Um, Kisdale, thank you very much for your comment. I'm just moved by your experience. I, I think everybody in the room room is and just wish you so much well uh, in terms of your future challenges. You've had so many, um, so many challenges to overcome and you seem to have done it every single time. So I'm sure this will be no different. I really like your um, focus on the need to include refugees. Again, this is something that Canada can insist on more. We're actually quite good in ensuring that refugees are part of our delegations or persons with refugees experience. I like that very much. But we do need to make sure that international agencies are incentivized, sometimes through funding, to help capacitate refugee groups and communities to deliver programs on their own. And um, the um, FEN, really, you just, this idea of a royal commission, how very interesting. And I'm only a few months into reading about Canadian. Um, immigration policy and administration. And I have to say, I find it as opaque as, as hell. The, excuse me for being so blunt. Um, statistics are really hard to find. There's very few assessments on impact. The, um, it's incredibly confusing. And so uh, I'm really looking to you and I hope that you're open to Michael and I coming back to you for some guidance on this because these are the kinds of issues we'd like to highlight more. And I'm sorry. I, I can't, I have no answers except to say, um, like uh, to the other panelists, um, I'm going to circle back and I hope you don't mind.
It's always a pleasure to listen to somebody who knows their territory. And Lynette clearly knows this territory very solidly. So I certainly look forward to reading the next book. Um, but for now, what I want to do is ask the panelists whether they have want to ask questions of each other before I open it up to questions. Any questions of each other? No. It's it's late on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> okay. Well, any questions from the audience on, on any of these? Um, My question, uh, just one question. My question concerns a contrast, if there is one, uh, between the refugee populations uh, that intend uh, in more peaceful times to go back to the countries they fled. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, the present population of uh, Ukrainian fleeing uh, the Russian aggression, uh, but with a view to eventually returning. Uh, and also uh, the Palestinian refugees who left on the founding of the State of Israel, I believe in 1947. And they were accommodated in refugee camps in surrounding countries, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, uh, perhaps Egypt. And to an extent, two or three generations later, they are still in refugee camps. Uh, perhaps some have integrated into, into Jordan, uh, but uh, they remain refugees. Uh, the question then is whether uh, recipient countries uh, draw contrasts between refugee population groups that have uh, come to their lands intending to settle and those who intend a temporary presence until they can return uh, to the countries in which they fled. Uh, the second aspect of the question, and this is perhaps more to uh, the gazelle, perhaps uh, why, why as well. Uh, whether it's a good strategy as a refugee uh, to express an intention to return, the Palestinian uh, claim of a right to return is something of an obstacle uh, to resolve in the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict. Uh, whether it's a, a, a good strategy uh, to uh, intend to integrate into the host country or to be there until it's possible to return. Are, are there any other questions? Maybe we can do a round or perhaps you want to respond to that. Thank you for that question. Oh, yeah. Okay, my name's Ruth. I'm just curious, in its book, I bought it. She doesn't have her name on the front of it. Most authors have their names flashed all over. It's like my kids, <laughs> kids ask the same question. Is definitely <laughs> modest? <laughs> that's all. Not modest. <laughs> Standard units. <laughs> Um, thanks very much. Um, Bernard, is, you're, that's a really interesting question as to whether or not, whether the receiving countries perceive the displacement to be, does it change how they receive people if they perceive it to be temporary or they perceive it to be more permanent? And there's no easy answer to that because it's very hard to, to tell whether a temporary phenomena is going to be permanent, I would say. So if you look at it, you, Ukraine's an interesting example because for me, normally temporary is, is um, addressed through strictly emergency uh, humanitarian funding. But one of the things that we saw very early on is a big commitment by development 
agencies to invest in reconstruction of areas that were destroyed in Ukraine much earlier than we could ever expect that in most places, in part because it happened in Europe. But, and also the surrounding countries immediately started to integrate Ukrainians into schools and healthcare and, and provide with, with employment opportunities. I think it's very, that's, that stand, that's the exception rather than the rule. If you look at the Syria crisis, which started in 2011, when refugees started fleeing into Lebanon and Jordan, most people at the time thought that would be a temporary issue. And, um, but it didn't change the way the Lebanese responded. They opened their homes. They, the response mechanism still should be very similar. It should, we should be starting to integrate people into national systems with provided support to those national systems after a certain period of an emergency response because the humanitarian response is simply not sustainable. Now, um, things have stalled. So Lebanon still has a million refugees in Lebanon from Syria. And now it's grappling with the economic con consequences of a fallout in its own economy and COVID. So the situation there is also not ideal. But it's to say that maybe there is a change in attitude, but my experience has been people respond to the immediate need. Then they are, get the longer it, it, the more protracted it becomes, the more weary they become, which is why more sustainable development funding to support those communities needs to come on screen. The other um, point that I would make in terms of protracted crisis is more and more refugee situations are protracted. In fact, if you look at some of the major forced displacement situations in the world, Afghanistan, um, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Colombia, uh, Myanmar, Somalia, Sudan, they've been going on for absolute decades and decades. And it's difficult to have development funding take root in these contexts, which are consistently interrupted by ongoing con con conflict and displacement. Um, so that's not a perfect response to your question, but it's the best I can do. Um, Ruth asked her, you asked the same question my kids asked me, um, but basically, I'm very happy with the cover of the book, the way it is, because this book is about so much more than the person who wrote it. And it was a really collaborative effort. As I said, we got so many interesting papers from people around the world. And I had good researchers at UNHCR and a good production team. So it's an institutional effort. And I'm very, very pleased. The, the, the cover basically is to give you a sense of both darkness and hope and moving forward, which was the design, the woman who designed it, that was her, her idea. Great. Any other questions? I don't think I need that. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a question for all the panelists, but I think especially in the sense of because you were involved in the proceedings. Um, how do you think the SDCA case might play out given this current- Can you introduce yourself? Oh, Sorry. yes, uh, my name is Matt, I'm a student at Osgoode. Uh, <laughs> You're most welcome. <laughs> um, I, I am a third year student at, at Osgood. Um, um, yeah, and uh, just to repeat the question, how do you think STCA might might play out given this this current court? And then um, you know some of the kind of common objections to especially Section Seven and the immigration refugee context of the charter as a bit of a blunt tool uh, for what can be kind of a delicate. Um, an intricate issue or set of issues like this. Okay, right. I, can the people on, do, should I repeat the question? Okay, it'll actually help me to repeat the question. So the first part of the question was about the SDCA case that was recently before the Supreme Court of Canada and sort of how, it, how it's going. Matt's trying to get me to cry in public, but um, uh, <laughs> the second part of the question uh, and correct me, Matt, if I'm if I'm misstating it, but it's about sort of the wisdom of using Section Seven of the Charter to try to assert these rights. Is that essentially it? Or? Yeah, that's, this is just a common kind of objection that I've heard. I don't know if I necessarily believe in it, but uh, it's just a criticism I've heard of the Charter as maybe too blunt of an object. Um, like a, a criticism in terms of it, the interpretation is wrong, or we should stop using it as a strategy to try to assert rights the latter. Okay. okay, thank you. 
Um, I'm just kidding. I, I, I can talk about the case without crying in public <laughs> as of recently. <laughs> um, it, it, and I don't know. So Matt's question is about, uh, you know, this, it, the, the challenge was put together over five and a half years. Um, the record is 30,000 pages. Uh, it involved uh, evidence from individuals who were uh, returned to the United States under the Safe Third Country Agreement and then put in jail there for the simple act of having sought Canada's protection. And they're kept in solitary confinement in county jails um, in the United States for the crime of uh, seeking Canada's refugee protection. And the evidence is incredibly uh, strong. <laughs> it's upsetting. Um, uh, and it was so compelling that the federal court uh, did say, no, this agreement is not okay and it does violate section seven of the charter. And um, the federal court of appeal uh, wrote one of the, maybe the most disappointing decision I think that could have come out of it um, that was dehumanizing and degrading to the individuals uh, who were the applicants and who provided evidence and to their experiences and to refugees in general. Uh, there's an actual paragraph in the decision that says their psychological suffering is irrelevant to this analysis because they're refugees and they're already suffering psychologically. Um, so I, I think it was a real failure of justice. Uh, we were very happy to uh, have leave granted by the Supreme Court because that's doesn't that happens in about two to four percent of cases. Um, and the hearing on the case was very difficult. Uh, anybody who watched it uh, would, would see that uh, the polite way of saying it is that the bench was very active. Um, uh, it, I clerked at the Supreme Court in 2013 and it's a really different court. Um, and uh, I really, I, it's always hard to say how, obviously how it's gonna play out because the people who are most vocal are not always the ones who reflect the overall view of the court. There's nine judges on the court. And uh, so the people who were vocal were clearly uh, very much not uh, in support of the appeal, um, but there was a lot of people who weren't vocal. And again, my, the evidence in the case is extraordinarily strong. Um, and there's three pathways for the court to side with us, either on administrative law grounds uh, or on our argument that um, this agreement violates the rights of women uh, in particular, uh, or that it should be sent back to federal court to determine that issue, or that uh, the detention practices in the United States do violate Section 7 of the Charter. That's a long answer, so I apologize. It's obviously been a, it's a, it's been a labor of love for five and a half years. Um, so there's a lot more to say on that. The section seven question I think is a really valid one and it's one that we are debating a lot now and has been for years within the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers in particular because of this very troubling uh, dichotomy between the Section 7 protections afforded to refugees versus the Section 7 protections that are recognized in cases like Bedford and Carter. And, um, but Singh tells us that refugees have Section 7 rights. And so, um, you know, I think there's a real valid argument to be made about trying to find creative ways of ensuring that the court uh, ex expands and reflects that. Um, but based on the questions that were coming to us in the Safer Country Agreement litigation, um, I think the future of it really remains uncertain and I, that will certainly impact on how uh, refugee advocates decide to move forward with it. Sorry for taking so much time. Yes. Any other questions from the floor? I, I had a question about protracted refugee situations, but I think you covered that. But I wonder also just thinking about the STCA in the European context, the Dublin Convention, how has that played out? Do we know? 
or do you? I don't. Okay. Okay. The Dublin Convention in the European context is a similar agreement between all of the European states to return, like return asylum seekers to their country of first origin, but of, of the country that they first attacked. But I'm not sure if that's given the past years of the Syrian conflict and and the Ukraine situation whether that's just kind of relevant now because of the numbers. I'm not sure. Any other questions so long or any other comments from our panelists or Ben in the in the balance? <laughs> I would be um, curious uh, to get uh, Nanette's and perhaps uh, some of the other panelists' view on um, what seems to be a, a very dire uh, financial situation uh, for UNHCR, given the comments that um, the uh, Director General has been making about uh, cutting programming, et cetera. Um, it's obviously an organization that's uh, greatly overstretched in terms of the demands that are being placed on it for all the reasons that we've uh, talked about. And, um, you know, is it perhaps time to think of an assessed contribution framework, uh, the way we do peacekeeping? Um, and, you know, if you, if you can't get... Uh, the Perm 5 to uh, agree to that kind of arrangement? I mean, is this somewhere where, you know, like-minded powers like Canada could say, you know, we're willing to um, uh, agree to such a kind of assessment and, and lead the way because uh, resourcing is, is a huge issue. Um, it's obviously true at the national level, but it's uh, doubly, if not triply true at the international level. And, um, um, you know, we're seeing we're seeing capacity problems right through the system because it has a knock-on effect uh, on uh, you know the many NGOs, civil society actors that um, are funded by UNHCR uh, to uh, to work with uh, refugees. Um, can I return to the question about the UNHCR last November? So I'm not in the best place to talk about its current financial situation, except to say that. The issue of assessed contributions has come up, I know, throughout history, and I recall quite vividly the, the current Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, when he was head of UNHCR, speaking at some length about the efforts to push that through and the resistance of states to agree to it. So it's, yeah, my understanding is it's not just resistance within the Security Council, but anything having to do with assessed contributions and the budget committee of the UN is a political nightmare, if I may say so. So I, I don't think we're going to move very far on that. I, I think um, we're really challenged at this particular point of time because of the conflicting priorities between um, addressing development setbacks due to COVID and the Ukraine, the Ukraine situation, which is leading to increased conflict um, competition for financing. But I think as well, and this speaks to a long-term issue, I think international agencies also need to um, take a very critical look at when they need to withdraw from certain situations in favor of more development approaches and how they need to transfer a lot of their responsibilities to more local delivery, which is going to take a number of years, but really needs political will in order to make it happen, not just on the basis of the international agencies themselves, but also the donors to support that transition in a way that's sustainable. Are there are no other are questions, you? comments of oh, Ben? Yeah, I just wanted to come back. I mean, are you saying, um, you know, make tough choices and agree not to do certain, or, you know, decide not to do, do certain things and take on certain missions and um are there ways of perhaps being a bit more creative with the un machinery and countries in the general assembly you know we've we've seen that in the current crisis in ukraine where the gen general assembly stepped up to the plate uh to um 
uh, you know, to try to sort of circumvent uh, a, a very difficult Security Council situation. So I just, I just, I mean, everything you said is absolutely true, Nanette, and you know, historically, you know, there's great resistance to to general assessments. But you know, as you say in your book, we're we're in a new kind of world, and it's not business as usual uh, when it comes to. Uh, you know, funding, you know, very key and critical international institutions like UNHCR. Yeah, it's a it's a big question, Ken, and I'm really, uh, I, these are my personal views, and they're my personal mm -hmm. views that are, I can't say that are based on a lot of research, except more, more based on experience. Um, finding creative ways to do things differently within the UN headquarters after five years of working there, I became quite disillusioned. So um, I'm not so sure that that's the best way to start. I'm pretty convinced that we should be doing really a forensic look, not just UNHCR, but all international agencies as to where we're putting our efforts and our time and our energies and our, and our scarce resources. Because we tend to do things year after year because there are needs, but not necessarily because we um, thoroughly assess what the impact of our interventions are. So mm -hmm. if we were being really radical, yeah, I, I think we need to take a whole new look and a, a very context specific look as to what we're doing and do we have our priorities right. And I think it's extremely difficult for emergency operations like UNHCR and other UN and UNICEF and others who are constantly having to respond to very pressing needs as they arrive. And that kind of long-term forensic analysis is not necessarily um, something that these agencies are have the capacity, the time, or the necessary expertise to do. But that's that's a more radical thought that maybe you and I can talk about another time. It's, For you, sure. Give me time sure. to, to study up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just let me say a few, yes, but just let me say a few words in closing. Ben said it very well. We're clearly in a very new international environment with huge challenges just on the displaced persons front, not to mention many more. Here at the law school, we do have a, a course next semester on international refugee law. The uh, parents' partner was already uh, Shazai Megan teaches, uh, co teaches with Judge Diner. And also, there is a, a competitive mood here on uh, immigration uh, and uh, refugee issues. I hope this meeting has started um, some very important conversations on a very important book. Uh, here at the university, I hope we can do even more to bring the knowledge that people create in these books to bear on real world problems. And this is one small step in that direction. Thank you all those online here in person for coming. And I hope the conversations continue among you all. Thank you.